This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about projective modules. Rather, it will be about the relation between projective modules and locally free modules. Um, so let's just recall what both of these are. So locally free modules we defined last lecture and these sort of correspond to vector bundles. So a vector bundle is a map from something to a space that, whose fibers are roughly speaking vector spaces. Um, in the case of rings, we saw that a locally free module corresponding to this is a module such that um, if you take a ring R and you cover it with open sets, cover its spectrum with open sets, spectrum of R F I to the minus one, then M F I to the minus one has to be free over R F I to the minus one. And these open sets have to cover R, which means the ideal generated by all these elements is equal to the whole of R. On the other hand, a projective module, module P is one with the following property that whenever you have a map from a onto a module B and a map from P to the module B, then it lifts to a map from P to A, making this diagram commute. So some basic properties of projective modules, all of which are easy to prove, is first of all, free modules are projective. Very easy to check that free modules have this property because you just take a basis for the free module, look at its images in B and lift those um, to elements of A. And that gives you a map from the free module to A. Um, secondly, it's also very easy to check that if P is projective, if P equals X plus Y is projective, then X and Y are also projective. So any sum end of a projective module is projective. A submodule of a projective module is not projective in general. Um, secondly, any direct sum of projective modules is projective. Again, this is very easy to check and I'm not going to bother doing it. Um, so we now have the following problem. Um, are projective modules the same as locally free modules? Or more generally, um, are projective things the same as um, locally free things? So let's ask the question, Does is projective the same as locally free? In other words, vector bundles. And there are two answers to this question. One answer is yes, and the other answer is no. And which answer you get depends who you ask. So if you ask an algebraic geometer, they will tell you that there are lots of examples of locally free things um, that are not projective. If you ask someone doing commutative algebra, they will tell you that um, these that, that locally free things are indeed equivalent. If you ask someone doing differential geometry, they again think that locally free things are projective. If you ask someone doing complex geometry, say complex analytic geometry, they will think that um, locally free things need not be projective. And this is very confusing because um, quite a few people have kind of started off in one area and switched to some other area and got very confused about whether or not locally free things are projective. So um, I want to try and explain why is there a difference. And 
Um, the trouble is I'm not really going to be able to give a terribly satisfactory explanation because it really uses a certain amount of cohomology. So I'm just going to have to um, um, quote some facts from cohomology. So the, 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 the basic thing is, um, let, let, let's talk about whether locally free things are projective in algebraic geometry. What you do is you get um, an exact sequence which looks like this. I'll, I'll explain this in a moment. So here A and B might be modules or they might be sheaves over a scheme or something if you're an algebraic geometer. So that the basic thing you get here looks like this. Um, so this X is something in homological algebra that I'll explain later. And I sometimes write in capital letters and sometimes small letters because this X here is supposed to be a sort of sheaf X. And this X here is just an abelian group X. And this thing is a piece of the growth index spectral sequence of a composed functor, which you probably don't want me to explain in detail. Anyway, the key point is that this X here vanishes if um, A is locally free as a module or a sheaf, or for that matter, it also vanishes if this is even locally projective. Um, this thing here, um, it vanishes for all um, or B, if and only if A is projective. So this bit vanishes if A is locally free, and this bit um, you want to vanish if A is projective. And this is an exact sequence. So locally free things are projective if this thing vanishes. So if this vanishes, then locally free implies projective. Um, and home of A to B is just going to be a module or a sheaf of whatever. So we've got the question, does this first cohomology group, whatever that means, vanish for all modules M? And the answer is yes, if you're doing commutative rings, or if you're doing smooth manifolds. So why does it vanish if you have a commutative ring or a smooth manifold? Well, it turns out that this vanishes if you can define partitions of unity. So partition of unity means if you've got a smooth manifold covered by open sets, can you write one as a sum of functions, each of which is supported in one of these open sets? So for commutative rings and smooth manifolds, there is a sort of partition of unity. And this implies that this group here always vanishes. And this implies that locally free things are projective. Um, on the other hand, if you do algebraic geometry or um, analytic complex manifolds, then um, in general, you don't have partitions of unity and this first cohomology group that I was talking about um, doesn't necessarily vanish. And there are plenty of locally free objects that aren't projective. So this is a sort of explanation of why there seems to be so much confusion in the literature about whether um, vector bundles or locally free objects are projective. Sometimes they are and sometimes they're not. Um, in fact, if you've done algebraic geometry, you may have noticed that even free things need not be projective, which is a bit disconcerting if you come from commutative algebra. Um, this isn't pathological at all. It, it occurs for quite natural examples. Um, even if you're working over one dimensional projective space and you, you take the um, free one dimensional module, sorry, free one dimensional sheaf, that's not projective. Um, well, this is really a course in commutative algebra, so we ought to be talking about the ring theory case. And for the ring theory case, um, 
um, locally free does indeed imply that a module is projective. Um, and we can ask, does the converse hold? So does projective imply locally free? And it does quite often. Um, the answer is yes for finitely generated modules. Um, and the answer is no in general. So what I'll do is I'll first quickly sketch why it's true for finitely generated modules and then give an example um, of a non-finitely generated module where it's not true. So um, let's just quickly sketch the reason with a number of details missed out because I'm feeling kind of lazy. Um, so if we've got a finitely generated projective module, um, it's quite easy to see that it's um, finitely presented and with rather more effort you can see that the stalks are um, free. So what does the stalks mean? Well, well if you've got a module M, um, the stalks mean the localization of M as a module over um, R of P. Here P is a prime of R, and this is the local ring at P. Um, the reason why the stalks are free is that projective modules over local rings are always free. That's actually a theorem of Kaplansky, and I might talk about this later, then again I might not. Um, so if we've got a finitely projective module, then it's finitely presented and the stalks are free. Um, on the other hand, if we've got a finitely presented module um, and the stalks are free, um, this implies that it's locally free. And again, this is something I might prove later when we talk about modules with free stalks if I feel in the mood for doing this. Um, the reason I'm not worrying too much about whether locally free implies projective is that um, in practice locally free modules that we come across are always obviously projective. For instance, they might be stably free and stably free modules are obviously projective because their summons are projective modules. So um, it's kind of nice to know this result, but we never really need it very much. Um, so um, now I want to, uh, to give an example of a projective module that is not locally free. Um, and here we're going to take um, the following ring R, which is all functions from an infinite set X to um, a the, the field with two elements. This is an example of a complete Boolean algebra. Um, complete Boolean algebras aren't actually used that much in commutative algebra. Um, um, they tend to have some rather weird properties. They're used very heavily in set theory and that they're, they're used a lot in Cohen's notion of forcing, which is used to construct lots of um, models of Zermelo set theory with various weird properties. Um, anyway, so you can think of this as being a function from an infinite set x to z over 2z, which is the same as um, a product of an infinite number of copies of z over 2z. And what this infinity is, I don't really care. It can be countable or uncountable or anything. And we're going to take our module to be the following ideal. It's just going to be the functions of finite support. So you can think of an element of R as being um, an infinite set of zeros and ones 
with um, usually an infinite number of zeros and ones, whereas the, the elements i will be um, something with all zeros after a certain point. Um, so first of all, let's show that um, i is projective. So for this, um, you notice that i is a direct sum of lots of modules i x, where i x is a, is a module of order two, and it is functions with support the point x in, in our space x. So this is a sum over all x. And now we notice that i x is projective because r is equal to i x plus um, the module of, of functions with support disjoint from x. So um, this is that the module r is projective. So i x is projective because it's a, 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 a direct sum and of a free and therefore projective module. Um, and now um, the direct sum of projective modules is projective. And we've just seen up here that I is a direct sum of projective modules. So I is indeed projective. Um, and now we show that I is not locally free. And for this, um, what we have to do is to work out what does i f to the minus one um, look like over r f to the minus one. Well, r f to the minus one, um, here f is any element of r, is still a product of copies of z over two z. So, um, um, Unless, so, so, so it's a product of a number of copies given by the support of, of the element f. So usually it would be just isomorphic to r. So um, what we find is that if f has finite support, then i f minus one is indeed free. In fact, it's just isomorphic to r f minus one. On the other hand, if f has infinite support, Um, we can easily check that i f to the minus one is um, over r f to the minus one it looks the same as i over r, and we find i is not so i f to the minus one is not free. So we want to cover um, um, the spectrum of R by a finite number of um, um, things of the form spectrum of R F I to the minus one, such that um, we want I, I to be free over this. So F I has finite support. But if f1 up to fn have finite support, then f1 up to fn obviously can't be the ideal r because these only generate functions with um, support, the union of the supports of all the fi, which is finite. Um, by the way, you've got to be a bit careful here because um, you might think that the spectrum of this ring is, is something to do with the set X. Um, and if the set X is finite, then the spectrum of R is indeed the set X. However, 
If the set X is infinite, its spectrum is all sorts of weird extra elements not in X called ultra filters. And if you want to know what an ultra filter is, you can go and look at a book on set theory and forcing, which goes on about them. Um, so um, the ideal I is a module that's projective, but not locally free. And of course, it's not finitely generated. Um, There's a, a final slightly funny example we can give using this ring, um, which is that for um, vector bundles over a smooth manifold, these have the property that the sum of finite dimensional vector bundles is a vector bundle, where um, this sum is possibly infinite. That's sort of quite easy to check because all you need to do is notice that for each point on a smooth manifold, you can find a contractible neighborhood and all vector bundles are, are trivial on that neighborhood and so on. However, the analog for rings is false. The direct sum of locally free modules, even of finite rank, need not be locally free. And we've um, actually seen an example of this um, which is the ideal I in the previous um, two slides contained in the ideal R, because here the ideal I was a direct sum of the ideals Ix, and the ideals Ix here were all locally free. Um, but if you take a direct sum of an infinite number of them, you get an, um, an ideal that's not locally free. Um, so for modules that are not finitely generated, you have to be a little bit careful because um, your, your intuition about analog between vector bundles and locally free modules kind of sometimes breaks down a bit. Um, so um, next lecture, we might be looking at modules that are stalkwise locally free, which is a, a slightly more relaxed condition of local freeness.